I am going to be teaching on um, Secrets of the Vine tonight. I have taught this lesson before. It was about three years ago. But before I started teaching again in January, as I sought the Lord about what He would have me to do, it's as if the Holy Spirit was saying, I want you to teach the lessons that have made a difference in your life. So that's what this particular study <clears throat> has done. It came into to my hands, into my heart, at a particular time in my life when it made all the difference. And some of you are at that critical juncture. As I know about some of your lives just a bit, not all the details, but I can sense that there are a lot of you that need to hear this teaching and I, I don't know about you, but it amazes me that God will teach me something and I forget it and he's teaching it to me again. And I'm saying, Lord, I, I, I thought I learned this. So we, we, uh, we need to, to be reminded. We need, you know, it's not good enough to go over something once. So um, we are going to look at this scripture again, John 15. And this is also... A scripture that is very dear to the hearts of this particular ministry because our name came from here. So before we look at this, if we would just go to, to the Lord in prayer. And precious Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to gather here, God, and to look into your word. And Lord, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. May your spirit... Give us teachable spirits tonight as we come together. And Lord, to really soak this in. Lord, that as we go through life, that we, your spirit will remind us about your gentleness, your love. Lord, how you will chase and how you were pruned. Lord, how you're inviting us to be bearers of fruit for your kingdom purposes. So, Father, I bless each one this, that has come to hear your words. And in the name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, teach us. Teach us, Lord. Our, you know our hearts are to know you. But, Lord, you know that sometimes you have to just take things that we won't give up on our own. But, Lord, it's all about love. And it's all about your desire to help us to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. So, Lord, give us fresh understanding as we look into your word and help us to learn and to grow and to know more than anything, Father, that we can trust you because you love us. You love us, Lord. Lord, help us to know when it hurts that you love us. And it's always for our good that you are teaching us the things that come to us as we walk through this life. In Jesus' name, be glorified. Be glorified, Lord. You are worthy. So let's, uh, <clears throat> we are going to look at this lesson from John 15. And this teaching is so typical of how Jesus taught. Uh, Jesus would take just a simple earthly story and he would be revealing such a powerful spiritual truth. That's the way he taught. And this message was one that he taught very close. I think it was actually the night before his death. And he really wanted to get his disciples, and yes, us, to get a hold of the truth that he has left us on this planet for one compelling reason, and it has everything to do with fruit. So let's look at that. Turn to John 15. And uh, before I begin, I do want to have discussion when we end, but I think I'll wait. Uh, it fits here to just let, let the message unfold. And then please, if you have thoughts come to you, make a note. Uh, we do really need to have discussion after this 
this lesson, and I, I think we can all apply this to, the, to our lives. I am the true vine. Of course, Jesus speaking here. And the Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Now, did everyone get an illustration that looks like this one up here? This will help you as we talk about this. And I can't help but think about, uh, we have the characters here. We need to identify the characters that Jesus is speaking of in this illustration. First of all, he says that he is the vine. Now, if you're like me, I didn't grow up in wine country, so I, I would think of the vine as that long trailing part, but it's not. It's actually the trunk that comes up out of the ground. You, you, so the, that's it's the trunk. The vine is the trunk. And uh, Jesus says that he is the vine. He is the trunk, that part that comes up out of the ground. And now the vineyard keepers would keep the vine right, it would end about waist height, then it would end in a great big gnarl. And then that's where the branches grow out from. Of course, Jesus identifies the vine dresser or the vineyard keeper as God the Father. And his, his job is to coax from these branches as many grapes as he possibly can get from them. Now, of course, you and I, Christians, are the branches. And we are the focus of the vine dresser's efforts. Why? Because that's where the fruit comes from. Okay? Very simple. Now, these branches are tied up or they're propped up to a trellis. They're just, you know, right there on the trellis, about waist height. And they're kept there where the air can circulate and where they can get sunshine and where they're easy to tend, you know, all during the year and then at harvest time. And again, the vine dresser is caring for them so that they'll have as much fruit as they can possibly bear. So we've already talked about fruit, and in the illustration that Jesus was using, of course the fruit would have been grapes, wouldn't it? Because he possibly was even really in a grape vineyard doing this illustration for his disciples. So, but what the fruit here that he is referring to is fruit are good works, which would be an action, an attitude, uh, it could even be prayer. It could be any of those things. But here's the key. It, would, it, glor it, bring, it values God because it glorifies Him. Now, you're going to understand that more as we go along. The fruit in our life is how God receives His due honor here on this earth. And I believe you have that on your illustration. We need to remember that. The fruit from our life is how God receives his due honor on this earth. And that's why Jesus said there in John 15 and 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Now we talked, I believe, just Wednesday about the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians 5.22. And that's the inner fruit that we have when we, you know, as we mature in the Holy Spirit. 
uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Spirit. That's not what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the outward fruit that we bear. When we allow God to work through us to bring Him glory. So that can, have a, that can look like a lot of things. That can be taking a casserole to a sick neighbor with the motive to glorify God. That can be spending your whole life as a missionary. I mean, it, that, that's the big contrast. But the key is, does it glorify God? Am I up here because I think it's good for you to look at me? Or am I up here because I want to glorify God? The latter one would be the one that is bearing fruit, and the first one, I'm getting my reward here, and that's the end of it. Do you see the difference? So, fruit equals good works that glorify God. Now, how important is this fruit bearing? Jesus said there in John 15 and 16, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. What is he talking about? Now he's saying not just fruit, but fruit that remains. This fruit that Jesus is referring to is our only permanent deposit in heaven. It always lasts. When judgment day arrives, the fruit that we produce as a result of our abiding in Christ is the only thing that we'll have to show for our time here on this earth. And as we unwrap this, you'll understand why this message is so important. But I do want to take a little trip over there uh, to, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 11 and talk about this time when our, our fruit, our works are judged and it's decided at that point whether or not they are fruit that remains that gives us rewards in heaven. So uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11. And this is um, the judgment seat of Christ, or the Bema judgment. And you're, if you're here, you're a Christian. You're, you're going to heaven. This is all about judging works. That's it. All about judging works. And it says there in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. To me, that's saying, that's the first test for your fruit, it has to be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. There's no, I mean, you're, you don't even have anything to work with if you're not building on that. Uh, verse 12, now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. So our works will be, if they're gold, silver, precious stone, what's going to happen when the fire of God tests them? They'll just be purer, won't they? That's what happens to gold and the silver and precious stones. In the fire, they're just purified. And when, the, our all, when Jesus judges our works, he'll know whether they were meant to glorify God or not. And if they were, they will be gold, silver, precious stones. But if not, they'll be, they're, they're, they're like wood, hay, straw. What does it do? It burns up, doesn't it? It burns up. And it, so... He uh, will judge at that time of what it says in verse 13 that our work will become clear. And uh, then it goes on to say in 14, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. How much clearer can it get than that? How much clearer? It's, it's really clear, isn't it? If what you do is glorifying God, I don't care what it is. If you're in private and you're praying for somebody and it's to glorify God, you've got a reward. But if you're just doing it because you think you have to, guess what? That's, that's it. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved and yet so as through fire. So that is what... Jesus was talking about when he was referring to fruit that would remain. That is the fruit that remains. The ones that stand the test of whether or not they 
they glorify God. And we know God knows that because He looks at the heart, doesn't He? He knows our hearts. He knows the intent and our motive when we do something. So let's go back now to, to the great vineyard and harvest time. And as we look uh, at the vineyard uh, in our illustration, notice there are four baskets which represent four distinct levels of eternal yield. And during harvest, you would find baskets under each and every one of the branch, branch, branches. And we're going to talk first about that, that basket number one. And it's empty, isn't it? Basket number one is empty. And Jesus was talking about that basket when he said in John 15 and 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. First, we're just going to identify the baskets. Okay. The second basket then would have several healthy clusters of grapes nestled in the bottom. The branch would, it's not barren. You could find a few grapes on it if you look hard enough. And Jesus described this one as bearing fruit. But the next basket, third basket, is probably about half full of plump, juicy grapes. And that during the harvest season, the vineyard keeper would be proud to carry this basket out of the vineyard with what Jesus referred to as more fruit. And when it seems that the harvest just couldn't get any better, look at that fourth basket. Because, oh my, it's overflowing, isn't it? It has big, juicy grapes just overflowing in abundance. And Jesus spoke of this one as the one that bears much fruit. Now, each one of us is a branch, and we are producing a clearly defined level of abundance for either bearing no fruit, fruit, more fruit, or much fruit. And don't make the mistake of thinking this is automatically progressive as you become a Christian. That's not the way it works, and you can even go from one and go backwards. Amen. It's, you know, amen. You all know all about that, don't you? So, um, but again, back to the vineyard keeper, back to the father. He wants to move us into whatever level is next. So he is actively tending our lives to keep to moving us from the barren to the productive, from empty to overflowing. He's always at work in our life doing that. We don't realize it sometimes, but it's true. And... He knows that more is always possible because he created us to bear fruit. And he knows the potential there. So let's think about that first basket first, the barren one with the empty basket that Jesus spoke of there in John 15 and 2. Let's look at that a little closer. And he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, in my New King James Version, and possibly in yours, when you read that takes away, it sounds like he cuts it off. And I used to understand it that way. And some people interpret that scripture as meaning that if you're not bearing fruit, you can't be a Christian, or that you can even lose your salvation. But I want to clarify that because when he says every branch in me, it's clear it's a Christian because Christians are all the time referred to as being in Christ. So this is a Christian. And um, is it possible to be in Christ and bear, not have any fruit for a season? Yes, indeed it is. Yes, indeed it certainly is. Now look at that, that remark that Jesus said there about every branch in me that he does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then in verse 3, he, got, he talks about you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. And it doesn't seem to make sense, does it? He's talking about taking away, and he's talking about clean. So let's uh, tie these two together, and I think you'll we'll get a better understanding of what Jesus was really saying. What does cleanness have to do with no fruit? First of all, let's go back to verse 2 where it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. That's not a good translation of the little original word there. It was A-I-R-O, the little word arrow. And it actually means to take up or lift up. It does not mean to cut off. Neither in the Bible nor in Greek literature is that an accurate translation. Uh, to get a better rendering, uh, one place would be Matthew 14 and 20, where it's speaking of the, uh, 
the miracle of the loaves and the fishes, and it said that the disciples arrow took up 12 baskets of food. You don't see any impression there that have cut off, do you? They took up 12 baskets of fruit after that miracle. Then in Matthew 27 and 32, Simon was forced to arrow bear Christ's cross, to take up Christ's cross. So let's go back there now to, to verse 2 where Jesus said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, lifts up. And you're actually going back to the vineyard with Jesus here, and you're seeing what the vineyard keeper would do to look at the little branch that is down there trailing down. You see that? Now, any of you that's done any gardening any, at all know that is very typical of what a new immature branch would do. It doesn't have any strength, and it would typically fall down there. But what does the vineyard keeper do? He comes along, he washes it off, he lifts it up. He will either tie it up or he will either prop it on something until it can get some strength and it will stay up by itself. So this was a perfect illustration of how our father, when he finds us down there in the dirt, in, which is so symbolic of sin, this little branch down there in the dirt, it will get mildew, it will get dusty, it will get moldy. It cannot bear fruit. When we are immature, when we're down there in the dirt, in the sin in the, of life, we cannot bear fruit. Our Father God will come along, He will wash us off, He will lift us up until such a time as we can have the strength to stay there on our own. So that is what Jesus is saying here. That little vine is precious to that vineyard keeper. We as young, immature, fruitless little vines are precious to our Father. He will not cut us off. He will wash us off, lift us up, and give us time to become strengthened through, you know, through other things that we're going to talk about now. So I hope that helps to help us to understand more clearly what Jesus was saying there and using this illustration. So let's talk now about some things that our Father will do. And I've given you this gentle God the Father, but we're going to see sometimes this gentle God the Father in order to strengthen His little vine will take some measures that are not that comfortable for us. So let's turn to Hebrews 12 and 5 and see what the Word of God tells us about that for this fruitless little Vine that's precious, nevertheless, needs some help, right? Okay, Hebrews 12 and 5. And see how the Father will help us during these fruitless seasons. And you, I think Pastor Donnie touched on this too, just Wednesday. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have all had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, now look at these agricultural terms in this sentence. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And that's exactly the word that you use when you pick that little vine up 
and put it, prop it up there. It's called training it. It's exactly what it's called. And it's to yield. You see, that's a term, too, of a harvest, isn't it? Yield. The yield is, is when everything comes in and, and you know, you, you have the harvest. So let's go back now, and, and what we're doing is we are talking about if the father finds that his little branch is fruitless, what will he do as he props it up? How is he going to encourage it to get strength on its own? And what we've read here in this scripture is that if our life consistently bears no fruit, our father will intervene to discipline us. And if it's necessary, he'll use painful measures to do that to bring us to repentance. But his purpose is to clean us up, to get us free from that dirt, to get the sin off of us, so that we can have an abundant life for his glory. Now, in those scriptures, we read that this chastening, it's no fun, is it? It's, not, it's, it's painful. It's painful during that season. But yet it has a purpose to yield that peaceable fruit of righteousness. God's discipline will start, but will begin if he finds a sin in our life that we're not confronting on our own. If we confront it on our own, then it's not necessary for him to. But if we don't, as a loving father, he, he must. Uh, and it would, it would end when the problem ends. And this uh, scripture also makes the point that our fathers on this earth discipline us as best they know how. A good father will do that, won't, won't he? And we respect that, but God the Father, and sometimes our earthly fathers make a mistake, don't they? they? They're not real good at their discipline. They do the best they can. But we know that when God the Father disciplines us, he, oh, he knows us better than we know ourselves. We can always trust Him. So that is, that's some of the points there that we read in that scripture. And also, it shows us that his discipline is revealing his love. Because it's saying that he's the source of the discipline. And that will help us sometimes when we're going through these things. And we realize that it is our Father disciplining us. And he's doing it out of love. And he disciplines all believers. So if we're under this discipline, it just identifies us as God's child, doesn't it? But most of all, that his action is always out of a heart of love. Now, when this little teaching came to me, uh, it uh, came at a crucial time in my life. And my daughter sent me this little book called The Secrets of the Vine by Bruce Wilkinson. I don't know if you've ever read it, but man, did it impact me. I desperately needed it. It is so, it's so amazing how God can get something into your hands, you know, with, with biblical principles at just the right time. That's happened to me more than once that God would use a gifted author and his word to bring something to me that I just, it just was critical to my moving forward at a particular time, which I'll share a bit. Uh, at the right time. But anyway, Bruce Wilkinson, the author of that little book, um, began to talk about the three stages of discipline that we just read about here in this scripture. The, the rebuke, the chastening, and the scourging is what we're going to look at briefly here. But he said that the rebuke, which is a lighter warning, the first one, was we reminded him when he was a child at home. And there were six children, and they would be sitting around the dinner table. And for some reason, I got the idea that Mr. Bruce was the troublemaker in that family. Because he said that uh, with those six children sat there, and a little trouble started stirring. He said his mother could walk into the room and sense what was going on, and she'd just raise her eyebrow. And if he was smart enough, that would be the end of the trouble. At, you know, and everything, peace would be restored and everything would be okay if he did respond. And he said even as an older adult, he could just think about his mother's eyebrow raising and he'd just automatically sit up a little straighter even at that point. So I thought that was really funny. So in Hebrews 12 and 5, it says, My son, do not be scourged when you're rebuked by him. So a rebuke, it would be like a verbal warning, and it could be heard just through your conscience. It might be something that the preacher says. It could be the Holy Spirit speaking to you through a scripture. It could be any of that. But it is the lighter warning that God's saying, raising his eyebrow and saying, pay attention. Something ain't right here. 
But in the next degree is, is chastening. And the young author at the dinner table would talk about how the discipline at this point gets a little more serious. If he hasn't responded to the, to the, little, to the rebuke, then guess what? He'll be sent to his room without his supper, won't he, at this point? So at this point, for us, the person, uh, you're not responding to the verbal warning. You're expressing your self-will over the person that should have authority. So in our Christian walk, we can get stuck at this level if we fail to respond to the discipline that, that is taking place. And you might have some symptoms like beginning to feel unfulfilled in church. You don't like to read. The Bible has lost its meaning to you. A lot of things, out, you're out, out of fellowship with God. So if you have any of these warnings, you know, it's a good thing to do some self-inspection and find out what's going on. We really need at that point to look for any ongoing sin in our life and, you know, just to cooperate with a father whose desire is just to pick us up and clean us off. And, you know, that's a miserable way for a child of God to live. If you're a child of God, you're just, you're not happy there. And you will try to find out what's going on and allow the Father to help you to move on. But Bruce went on to talk about if then if that didn't work, guess what happens next? The scourging comes. He would get a good spanking, wouldn't he, for being so rebellious. So to scourge is to whip, to inflict punishment. And in this level of discipline, it means that you're living in open sin. You have no regard for what the, the Father, for what the Holy Spirit is revealing to you. You've not heeded previous attempts by God to rescue you from your, your, rebellion, your rebellion. Now, you might ask the question, why do so many seemingly nice Christian people, don't, why don't they clean up their act? Why do they continue to go around the mountain, you might say, continually, not moving on, not listening to the correction of, of the Father? Uh, I wanted to name a few of those. Some people think that their sin doesn't have consequences. You know, we're so apt to think, it, like, you know, I'm, I can't help but think about Adam and Eve God told them they'd surely die if they ate of the tree. Guess what? They didn't fall dead on the spot, did they? But they couldn't see it, but their spirits died and they began to die physically. So that, uh, to me, that's the way sin is. You may not immediately see any consequences, but something has happened and it just hasn't materialized yet. But some people, because they don't see immediate consequences, they think that sin has no consequences, but that's just a lot. It's not true. And some think that they uh, enjoy their sin too much to quit. We know that there can be pleasure to sin for a season. And some people think they can't quit, but we know that's not true. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you can. You can. You have the power to walk away from sin. Uh, my sin won't make me less effective. And then I think this is especially a dangerous one in our society. My problem isn't even a sin. You know, I don't know what to say except black and white is not black and white. And, I mean, people just, I guess it's because they don't realize how holy God is that they don't realize how black sin is. I don't know. So, but uh, hopefully all of us can remember a time in our lives or something in our lives that we were bound by and God brought us out of that, an attitude or a behavior or a thought pattern, and we can look back and we say, praise the Lord, I'm no longer bound by that. Hopefully we can all remember the, something like that. that we, and that means you're moving forward with God. And so now that's how the, the vine dresser, how our Father God will deal with the, uh, the, the basket that has no fruit, the branch that has no fruit. So now let's move on to the second one, the second basket that has some fruit. And to illustrate that, Bruce Wilkinson in that little book told his story about moving to the country and the grapevine. So he was a suburbs guy and at some point they decided to move out to the country. And they're out there looking at this house in the country. And uh, between Bruce's house and the neighbor, there's a fence. And it has a grapevine on it. 
And oh, it has all these long branches and they're green and they're flowing and they're beautiful. So Bruce begins to think about harvest time and he knows the ways of country folk. And he's thinking harvest time, we're going to share those grapes with the neighbor. And he can hardly wait because he loves grapes. So time goes by and he's bought the house and he's out there in the garage and he's unpacking the things there in the garage. And he notices his neighbor over there at the fence line where the grapevine is, was rampant and growing. And the neighbor's got on the overalls, big old country guy, and he's got these big old shears in his hands. And he chopping away and all his branches falling everywhere. And Bruce is just getting more and more discouraged. And finally he goes over to the neighbor and he begins to share with him what great expectations he had of sharing the bounty from the, that, those grapes when they came in. And his neighbor patiently lifted his nice clean shoes over across the fence and he sized him up and he began to say, Well, Mr. Bruce, we can either have a lot of flowing, long, great vines, or I can chop, cut them off, and we can have some fruit. We can't have both. <laughs> so he told that illustration about where Jesus said there, every barren, he said, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear fruit more fruit. So at this point you can see Jesus moving over from that barren branch that we were talking about to one that has all this lush growth but very few grapes on it. So this is important for all of us to understand. If there's some fruit in your life, you're doing something right and you are worth pruning. <laughs> you get it? So, God at this point is attempting to remove some self from our life. And our proper response is to cooperate with Him and to trust Him. Now, think about a test of faith. It's not testing anything unless it moves you further than any previous test. And that's why these tests of faith many times don't seem reasonable and they don't seem fair. That's why we want to pull back when it seems like we've reached our limit. But if we don't cooperate, then we'll never know about the fruit that God really can bring from our lives if we trust Him. So, please get a hold of this truth. In this situation, our Father is not chastening us. He's seen potential. He sees your fruit. He might just be a little bit, you see, in this situation. And he says, I see potential for you to bear more fruit. And he knows what it takes for that to happen. Going to have to cut some self away. And when it, what this self looks like is any commitments, other things that we've made priorities to make greater room for his abundance and for his glory. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had those times in my life when I've just been so in love with the Lord, I would ask Him, God, help me to be more like Jesus. Did you know you're asking for the shears? <laughs> Did you know that? I've done that without realizing it. So, that pruning is how God answers that prayer, that our life would please Him and have a greater impact for eternity. So if discipline is about sin, pruning is about self. In this pruning, God will ask us to let go of things that keep us from His kingdom purposes and for our ultimate good. But if pr pruning is cutting, and cutting hurts. 
So this is what I want us to try to get clear in our spirits tonight. The difference between being chastened and corrected and pruned because they feel a whole lot like. Okay? We'll unwrap that more as we go along. But think of this. The pain of pruning comes now, but the fruit comes later. And it's the same way in the vineyard. It's seasonal. I don't know if you've ever noticed a great vineyard in the winter, but they prune them severely back and they look totally dead. And that's the way it can look in our lives for a season. But that great vineyard in the spring, you'll begin to see just a little bit of growth, won't you? You'll begin to see a little bud here and there, a leaf here and there, the the vine come out a tad, the green begin to appear where it looks so dead. But, you know, it still takes more time. It takes all summer, doesn't it, for the grapes, the little bitty green grapes to start to appear. And then even more time for those grapes to begin to fill out and get sweet enough to pick. And that's the way it is in our life. It's, there's a, it's a season from the time that we're, we're uh, pruned until the time that the harvest appears. And it can seem like a long time. But the purpose of discipline and pruning are entirely different. But like I said, and I couldn't stress it enough, they both hurt. And there's a danger if we get it confused. If we we get confused when we're being pruned and we think it's being disciplined, we we can actually rebel, can't we? We can inspect our lives for sin and not find any, and we can get angry with God. We can be confused about what's going on and not have the proper response. You know, if we search our lives and we can't find anything wrong and we feel like God is, is disciplining us, it, it can really turn, uh, the irony of it all is it can actually turn you back into needing discipline if you misunderstand what's going on and you have a wrong reaction. And that is just a vicious cycle that's unnecessary if we can get a hold of this truth and apply it to our lives. And I'm not going to go over it tonight, but you have a little chart there on your illustration that lays out the difference in pruning and uh, discipline so that you can uh, refer to that. Now, in this third level of pruning, which Jesus called more fruit, uh, a horticultural bulletin really gave an explanation of what that looks like uh, in this third level. And this bulletin says, the vine's ability to produce growth increases each year, but without intensive pruning, the plant weakens and its crop diminishes. Mature branches must be pruned hard to achieve maximum yield. So while that early pruning is mostly about our outward activities, our priorities, the mature pruning will go into your values and your personal identity. At this point, God moves in close for uh, intensive pruning because now, now, you are really ready to produce some fruit. That's the mature pruning that we're talking about. But most Christians never get this far. When Jesus told his disciples what it was going to cost them if they continued to follow him, what happened? Most, a lot of them turned back. They weren't willing to pay the price. But the ones that hung in there, their fruit is still uh, rewarding us today, isn't it? So do we want to have comfort for a season or do we want to have an eternal impact? That is the, you know, that's what we really need to ask ourselves when we're not, when we have these times when we want, want to rebel against the pruning or whether we're going to cooperate with God and move on. So, um, in James 1, 3 and 4 spoke about this time when he spoke about, let the testing of your faith have its perfect work that you may perfect, be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So in this mature pruning, um, as I said, God's shears are going to intensify and come close to the core of who we are. And at this point, his goal is to bring us closer to that perfect and complete image of Jesus. 
So these tests of faith, we're going to talk about what they look like. There are various trials, there are hardships that invite us to surrender everything of great value to God, even when we have every right not to. You'll understand what I'm talking about as we go along. In these situations, um, we're going to be invited to surrender things of great value. As I said, we may feel assaulted or stretched by the circumstances, but we don't feel distant from God. We may be tr feel like we're tried by Him, but we won't feel judged or guilty. Now, please keep in mind that not every painful experience in your life is a result of pruning. If someone in your life is experimenting with drugs or sex or other destructive things, God didn't cause that so he could use it to prune you. If you got a bad health report, God didn't cause that just to, 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 uh, to use it to prune you. He didn't initiate it to see how you'd react. But l let me tell you the good news. The good news is that whether or not God initiates a hardship in your life, he can use it. If you turn it over to Him, we remember that promise that He'll work everything to our, to our good. So, you know, I don't think we even need to be concerned about the, the, uh, where this, the issues that we're dealing with come from. But we can be sure that things like I just named, God doesn't do those things. But He can use them anyway. And He will if we allow Him to, regardless of the source of the initiation. So even though the duration, the depth, the breadth of these pruning seasons is going to vary, remember what a season is. It doesn't last indefinitely. So a season is coming when we'll know that we're no longer under the shears and we we'll begin to see evidence of personal transformation in our lives and we'll have an expanded opportunity to glorify God. And Paul is a very good example of that. Remember that long list of things he told us that he had been through? But I'm telling you that Paul's branch is still yielding fruit today, isn't it? Because he did endure all that. So this mature pruning is God's way of helping us to practice his command to seek first the kingdom of God. And we have to have some help to do that. So... Um, Again, I want to reassure you that his goal is not to plunder, it's not to harm, but it's to liberate us so that we can pursue the true desire deep within our heart, which is his kingdom. Now, this kind of pruning will go beyond rearranging your priorities to the heart of what defines us. The people we love, the possessions we cling to, even our deep sense of personal rights. Those are the arenas that God must rule in if we're to bear much fruit. So we may go through these long seasons in our faith walk when we can't answer questions like why, how long. We only know who, our loving Father. And all we can do then is just say, hold me, Daddy. I'm trusting you. Just hold me, Daddy. I know that it's all about you. And I don't think we ever get to that place until we've learned that we can trust God. And in these seasons, how we respond makes all the difference. If we complain, if we rebel, if we compromise, or if we run away, we won't go to the next level. But if we trust the Father... We can walk through these times with joy and comfort. And we can keep our eyes on the prize and bear the pain of whatever's happening. Now, I wanted to just jump in here with a personal testimony so you'd know that I know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to know where to jump in, isn't it? But I thought I would tell you uh, about how I lived in uh, Mars Hill up in the mountains in North Carolina. I had lived there for quite a while. 
And I was there, uh, and I'm going to refer to my family, and when I refer to my family, I'm speaking of my husband and myself, my son and his wife and his two sons, my daughter and her husband and their daughter. That's what I mean when I say my family. So at that point, many years ago, my family lived up in Mars Hill, and we were there among other family members. And God began to draw my family out of our larger family. We had a very small Abraham story going on for many years. So he drew us to a place in Polk County, North Carolina, just property that was just property. It had absolutely nothing on it. But uh, my husband at that time and I, we were kind of dangerous together because we had a bad habit of seeing potential. We're not afraid of hard work and we would dig into anything. So we took that 20 acres and um, gave our children some property um, and began to make that our home. And that, I'm telling you all that to tell you, that time in my life was like a time when God was so real and He was so, His presence was so amazing, it made us spiritually crazy. I, I don't know, I'll, I think you'll understand that as I talk about it. But the, my, our little group, we would pray together, we went to church together, we, I mean, we was, it's like the Lord was moving so mightily that, I mean, nothing surprised you. And I didn't realize at the time it was a setup to make me uh, courageous to go on to another step. I, I don't know, but I'm looking back, I can see that. But we... Um, we, my husband, husband and myself built our dream home there. And before you get the wrong idea, we, it was just another amazing miracle that by God's provision, this all came to pass. And he put a lily business in my hand, that hands that allowed me to minister to other people. They would come, and I named this business, Consider the Lilies from Matthew, and it was like there was just so many opportunities to glorify God. Such an amazing time when the whole family was just, you would just see God move in miraculous ways. It was just ordinary every day. It was just, I mean, I could write a book about what happened during that time when the hand of God was on our family and moving in every area of our lives until it was just, you expected it every day. Something going on. Uh, so anyway, we were there for a season, and then it was like everybody was so content. We were just living on this high, and God began to move, to uh, inspire us to move to Florida. Now, you guys, I know you think I'm crazy, but this is really what happened to us. And we had six mature adult Christians, and we didn't do anything without going through all the steps of, is this really God? I mean, we didn't just have some whimsy going on and jump in, we would, you know, we would, in, we would uh, inspect each and every aspect that you're supposed to when you want to know clearly whether you're hearing from God. Because it was no small thing to take three families to relocate to Florida when you didn't have a job, you didn't know why you were going there. And, you know, it's just, but my Lily customers would come and I'd share this with them and you know, it was, it was an opportunity to testify, and I don't know, it was just like an amazing time, but we finally accepted that, yes, God is speaking, and we're supposed to do that, so there's a lot of steps involved, so we began to make, take steps to sell our homes and to go to Florida. So here, my son and daughter, they sell their properties first. Didn't cost, you know, didn't cost as much, easier to sell, and so there, they, they've moved on to Florida, and it, that was like in the spring of, um, when did 9-11 happen? 2001? 2001. So here I am sitting in my, in my dream home. 9-11 happens and guess what? Real estate's not selling. Now let me go to, to this place to where God has taken me to this pruning where he strips everything away that has value to you. Get a picture of this. I'd had this life, very active in my church, a teacher, da 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 But it was very fulfilling, you see. I had my lily business, I had my lily customers, I shared my lilies, the delight of my life. I had my family, my little grandchildren, playing down in the pond. Every, we'd get together, you know, we had this wonderful life of fellowshipping around God and the dinner table. So here I am, sitting on this 
60-foot porch overlooking a pond. I'd sold the lily field because we were trying to get to prepare to move away. My family was gone. We'd given up our church because God moved us out of there. I had nothing. I had my husband. Thank God I had my husband. I had nothing else. You, under, you see? God, I, and these were all good things. They all glorified God. You see what I'm saying? They weren't like they were bad things. It was good stuff. And my heart was to glorify Him through it all. But they're all set with none of it. So you, you see the illustration? But they're all set on that back porch and I would have Jesus sitting in the chair beside me. And I would talk to Him. And I was confused. And that little book got into my hands about the secrets of the vine. Just then, coincidence! Right, Alan? We talk about coincidences. And I began to understand that he had seen the potential for more fruit. And it made it okay. It made it okay. So, that's, I'll tell you a little more as we go along, but I wanted to make sure you understood how some self can be stripped away. Even good things, even things that you have every right to hang on to, even things that you believe, and they do glorify God, but it brings Him glory somehow to see you give it up and to move on to a new level. So that's where I found myself at that point. So let's now look at this last secret of the abiding, of the vine, the most fruitful, the abiding, I believe, where the Lord was taking me at that time. So, after seeing God act through our lives and the chastening and the pruning, pruning, our conclusion, our human way of thinking would be that if fruit equals good works, then surely much fruit would equal many more works. But God's ways are not our ways. So you can see Jesus now in the vineyard. He would turn his disciples' attention away altogether from all that activity that he had been bringing to their attention. And he probably leaned over there to that great big a great vine right there where all the gnarl is and where that massive trunk divides out into the branches. And Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So Jesus at this crucial point is telling the disciples what should happen next. After discipline to remove sin, after pruning to change priorities, abide, abide in me, he says. Abide in me. Now right there where Jesus' fingers are, where that ancient trunk is meeting the vigorous growth, that's where the abiding happens, right there. That's where the connection is, where the branches meet where the sap comes up and the nutrients flow out of that big gnarl out into the vines. And that sap reminds me so much of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the nutrition life-giving that comes up out of Jesus and flows through us, isn't it? You can't see it. He's powerful, though. He brings the nutrition and the only limitation to how much sap can flow up out of that trunk into the branch is how big that circumference is and if there's any obstruction. And the obstruction for us would be like sin, wouldn't it, or self. Sin or self or priorities out of order would keep the abiding from being that great flow that God wants it to be and that we truly in the depth of our heart that's what we want <clears throat> so at this place this fourth level God's purpose in our spiritual maturity is really not more what we're going to do for him but that we choose to be more with him at this point it goes from doing to being 
So to, to abide means to remain, to stay closely connected, to settle in for the long term. And there within just uh, uh, six verses of John, in John 15, Jesus says abide ten times. And he knows he's about to leave his friends. But he knows that they cannot possibly do the miraculous things that are expected of him, them unless they abide in him. And he knows, you know, that we, neither can we. We can't do what our hearts want to do and what he desires us to do unless we abide in him. So now let's look at these mysteries of abiding. And notice there that Jesus said in verses 4 and 5 that we are helpless to bear fruit alone. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself, for without me you can do nothing. And just go back to our illustration that we've been looking at and imagine that great branch broken off from the trunk, lying down there in the dust, it won't produce one more leaf. It's impossible for it to flower or have another grape if it's broken off of the vine or the trunk. Uh, Jesus said in verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me... Now get a hold of this one because I think this one is also misunderstood. This comment of Jesus in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now, Jesus is not threatening this barren branch with hell, but he's making a dramatic point. It's to, if, if we're not abiding, we wither and we die, and we're of no spiritual use. And to get a better explanation, you might want to make a note to look at Ezekiel 15, 3 and 4, because there Ezekiel talks about, he makes a, he, um, he makes a point about how the olive tree has many uses. There's a lot of things you can do with the olive tree, but a grapevine, if it's not bearing fruit, the only thing it's fit for is to throw it in, make fuel out of it. So that, that's what Jesus is saying here. And that's why we were created to bear fruit. And if we're not bearing fruit, we're useless. We have no spiritual value. But notice the implied promise there. If we do abide, if we stay closely connected, if we're drawing on that spiritual nourishment from our Lord and His power is flowing through us, that nothing is going to hold us back from the most abundant life possible. So what is this abiding all about? This abiding is all about the most important relationship in our life. It is not measuring our faith. It's not saying how much Bible do you know. It's, it is uh, in abiding. We're seeking. We're longing for. We're thirsting for. We want to know. We want to hear. We want to respond to the person of Jesus, don't we? That's what abiding is all about. It's about that relationship. And the uh, challenge in abiding is that we would break through from just dutiful activities to just this beautiful, flourishing relationship with God the Father through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And when I finally got to move from Polk County to Florida, that was the season that the Lord took me to was this abiding I went from all the activity that I had there in Polk County. We found a wonderful church in Florida, but I found that I was just sitting at other people's feet and learning. That's where the Lord took me to. And I remember when I was in Polk County, I was just so impatient to resume my activities. I really, I thought, I'm doing this and this and this. I've really got to go do that. You know, it's just like I've got to go to a higher level. And that was really my mindset. But instead, after all this pruning that the Lord did to me, it took me down and I sat at other people's feet. And God took me to these amazing people that I sat at their feet and I learned about uh, intercessory prayer. I learned about deliverance. I learned about healing. I, I, God put me at the feet of some master teachers. And I was very content there. I wanted to serve. I loved it. I loved just to serve. And he taught me so much in that, that time of abiding. So I went from all that activity. God had to strip some things away that I thought were good. And they were. But he had to strip it away to get me ready for just some abiding. <clears throat> So 
So let's think about this abiding and the uh, promise that it carries. Jesus said in John 15, 7 and 8, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear more fruit. You know, nothing pleases our Father more than when we ask for what He already wants to give us. And that when we're in this place, when we're allowing His priorities and His passions, His purposes, that's what's motivating us. You know what we're going to ask for? We're going to ask for the things that's close to His heart, and it delights Him to give us those things. He loves that. And I want to just leave a warning here about harvest time. In the natural, in the spiritual, there's always a grape robber that'll try to steal the harvest, right? So now that we've, we've studied this scripture, I hope that we understand, you know, how the Lord is working in our lives and we won't misunderstand what's going on and have a wrong reaction to it. And we'll, you know, we will, if the enemy comes along and tries to instill doubt in us or distrust or discouragement, then uh, you, you, you can trust, you can believe he will try to do that. He'll try to discourage you. He'll try to, to make you to think that, you know, that uh, God doesn't love you or whatever, whatever he can. He will try to, to discourage you. And that happened to me too down there when I finally moved to Florida because we hadn't sold our home in uh, Polk County and um, the, my, the kids had found property down there. It was up to us to buy it. So we mortgaged the house in Polk County, which we owed absolutely nothing on. Had to take out this big mortgage to buy the property in Florida. Found myself down there in Florida with a big mortgage and the job that my husband had been promised wasn't there, and I'm the one that handles the finances, so it really began to get to me, and the enemy began to steal my joy. So I can just say, you know, use my experience of giving in to that for a while and, and warn you the enemy will try to steal away what God is trying to do. But let me tell you the good news. The good news is while I was in that state of getting depressed, I went into church one evening, um, and the, I stilled myself and began to worship, and the Holy Spirit began to speak to me again. We had done all this in obedience to God. And there I had the big mortgage, and, and I, everything was just like, you know, stealing my joy away, and it was on my heart and on my mind, but there I was worshiping. I wasn't thinking about it then. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and He said, If it brings more glory to show how I'm going to provide for you from week to week, then that's the way it will be. I mean, I remember the exact words. But, I mean, if you'd told me I had a million dollars, I wouldn't have got any happier. Because you know what that said to me? It said, none of this is happening to you by chance. I've still got it all under control. I know exactly what's happening to you. That's what it said to me. And that's all I needed to know because I had felt alone. I would felt like I had it all and, you know, where's God? He's got me into this and where'd he go? But somehow all that was bringing him glory and that was more important than my uh, sense of well-being. But at the same time, even though he didn't, the words didn't come out speaking it, I, I knew that written between the lines was, it won't be long now. Do you know how you, when God speaks to you, you, you don't hear something, but you do? And sure enough, just not be, before, you know, and during all this, I know, God, I said, God, I know it's 9-11, but you can sell that house. You know, I'd been telling him how to do it, and he wouldn't listen. I said, this would really bring you, you know, you'd get a lot more glory if you'd just sell this house during 9-11. But he didn't listen. He thought it brought him more glory for me to trust him somehow. I don't get it, but anyway, that's the way it worked. So anyway, when he spoke to me like that, it just, it, uh, I mean, it just, the load lifted, and I was fine because I knew I'm not in this alone. God has it all in his hands, and somehow this is bringing him glory, and that's all that matters. So, we do want to try to guard the harvest uh, and I want to, just to say a little bit more about that, that the enemy would, does want to discourage you. He wants to confuse you. He wants to tell you that if, you've, if you have identified yourself at one of, of those low levels, 
And the enemy is trying to tell you that God cannot use you in any meaningful way. You just tell him right now, you're a liar. You're a liar. Because look how God used those disciples when they were very unlearned, when they were just immature. He used them to perform miracles, and he used them in many powerful ways. So don't listen to that lie. And God's plans for you are unique. They're specially suited to you. And in the same way that that vine dresser goes through there and he looks at the branch, each individual branch and he decides what that branch needs, that's how the Father deals with you. He deals with you personally. You're, you are unique and he will deal with you in that way. So don't compare your progress or your life to what's happening to anyone else. Amen. You just don't, that's just not the way the Lord works. And also the, uh, the, uh, the robber will try to convince you that, well, you're too, it's too late. You're, maybe you're here in this lesson and you're looking back and you think of all the opportunities you've missed and how you haven't responded appropriately. That's a lie too. Because God will work with you all through your life. As long as there's a breath in you, He will continue long-suffering, merciful. He never gives up on us. So start where you are, wherever it is, and know that the Lord is ready to, to help you. And also, God does have His sovereign timing, and we may get discouraged because we feel that our yield is small. But in Philippians 1 and 6, God pr promises that He is faithful to bring forth, you know, what the good work that He has begun in us. And let's remember the gift of joy that Jesus spoke of there in John 15 and 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. There is nothing more wonderful than a heart of joy, a life of joy. And God has brought me into that season. And when, with my precious Alan, I have laughed. I have been a child again. I have never laughed so much in my life. God truly has me in a season of joy. And I am so uh, enjoying being this the little daughter of his, just abiding in him and, and laughing like I didn't have a care in the world. And most of the time, I don't. So um, that, that is the gist of the lesson. I wanted to give Wendy a moment to come down, and I do want us to. I know, it, you know, I don't know what time it is, but if you need to go, feel free to do so. If you'd like to stay and, um, and join in some discussion, then we'll do that. I thought that would be a good way to do it. You're free to go, or you're free to let, let's talk about this, because uh, I hope you get how important this lesson is. It certainly has made an impact on my life.